is we move on to the last segment of the module which talks about what is the future hold for battery industry or what are the prominent discoveries that have been made in battery industry so let's look into it talking about the future of battery industry the transition to renewable energy and electric automobile vehicles brings in more reliance on battery and energy storage technology the battery industry is expected to worth more than 90 billion dollars or 7 lakh crore rupees by 2025 with a 5% cumulative annual growth rate and these demands are ever increasing and for which innovative ideas are required to cater to these demands and current battery knowledge does isn't enough for example the current ev battery packs need to fall at a cost of about 100 dollars per kilowatt hour from the current 190 to 250 kilowatt hour per uh, range packs the chart we've seen here divides batteries into five segments namely starter lightning and ignition batteries which are used for automotive industries and diesel engines second electric vehicle battery packs third consumer electronic devices fourth stationary battery stationary battery energy storage that is ber which is required for renewable energy industry and others such as aviation drones and power tools no single battery type wouldn't and can't cater to all these five segments consistent research and development in the field of batteries and various materials have to be looked upon to improve efficiency in all these segments but we will be specifically looking into development in lithium ion to see what the future looks for them right now even in lithium ion three development starters stand out and have high potential to be developed these are silica anodes advanced cathodes and solid state electrolytes a majority of today's startups work on these and we can also see energy density of various lithium ion technologies which are being developed in the graph below talking about silica anodes current lithium ion technologies use graphite as the anode material which have very less energy density about 250 kilowatt hour per kilowatt per kg compared to that of silica which is about 4000 kilowatt per kg thus just blending some amount of silicon in graphite can theoretically bring about an increase of 40% in energy density but the problem silica faces is this anode pulverization anode pulverization that is increasing volume and breaking of silicon on increasing charge on the anode in advanced cathodes we deal with increasing the energy density of batteries by improving lithium cathodes and trying to innovate with the crystal structure you can see various kinds of crystal structures developed and the consequent reactions in this image here a problem with the current battery systems is that the presence of a liquid or a gel electrolyte makes the battery prone to voltage breakdown which leads us to the next field of innovation and that is solid state batteries solid state electrolytes have been seen as the most disruptive technology in lithium ion battery systems till now and it has many unforeseen benefits the development is to replace current electrolyte systems which is made of organic solvents dissolved lithium salts and a polyurethane separator by a single thin iron conducting membrane it makes use of pure lithium anodes thus readily increasing energy density by approximately 40% and since it has a solid electrolyte it prevents voltage breakdown allowing us to reach higher voltage level and thus paving the way for use of advanced cathode materials and cathodes such as lithium sulfur and lithium oxygen but most important of all battery safety is primed since formation of dendrites is prevented and electrolytic leakage is made impossible let's clear this out with a short video Batteries have come a long way since the good old days when mercury was considered medicine. Wireless electricity to power airplanes was a thing, and the first lead acid batteries ruled the world, which funny enough, had an energy density of less than 40 watt hour per liter. But since its invention in 1859, batteries were never a big hit. They even tried to use it with electric cars at the time, but these batteries weren't powerful enough to do anything with it. It would take 120 years for batteries to get somewhere when during the 1970s and 80s, lithium ion technology was in the works by John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, Rashid Yazami, and Yakira Yoshino. But the early lithium batteries were famous for a few problems, ranging from losing capacity with a short period of time to bursting into flames. Let me put it this way, they weren't as reliable as they are today. In 1991, lithium ion batteries started to be commercialized by Sony, which was one of the first companies to have this technology, and at this point in time, the energy density increased only a little, or from about 40 watt hour per liter to about 190. 30 years later and Samsung is close to finalizing its research towards an all solid state battery which delivers an unprecedented 900 watts per liter and a minimum lifetime of 1000 cycles. Hold on to your lunches my dear viewers because things are about to get interesting. Hello everyone, Subject Zero here. 
Lithium is by far the best candidate for high energy density batteries. Not only is abundant in nature, but in theory, its energy density of 6,389 watt hour per liter can surpass that of gasoline. Just to give you an idea, the energy density provided by gasoline is at current, or at the making of this video, about 15.8 times more energy dense than batteries, or 9,500 watt hour per liter compared to lithium ion batteries ranging from 250 to 600. Of course, if you take into account that gasoline combustion cycle is less efficient, such that for every liter you burn, you get at most 40% of that energy, then the difference drops to about 6.3 times. But let's go with that, assuming efficiency to be around 40%. Side by side, we can easily see why interest in batteries increased so much in the past decade. What this means is that if we could reach the full potential of lithium-ion batteries, the range per charge for Model 3, for instance, would be multiplied by almost 10, or from 518 kilometers to 5,000 kilometers in one charge. What it also means is that instead of having 6 to 8,000 batteries, we could have cars with only 1 to 2,000 batteries with a range of 1,000 kilometers, if not more. Not only that, but decreasing the number of batteries makes it safer, charges faster, and is more environmentally friendly. But that is only possible with solid-state batteries, and we all know that there are mainly two problems with them. The first one is dendrites which causes volume expansion, ultimately causing the battery to fail or even burst. Then we have the low coulombic efficiency, which causes the battery to degrade faster, having a lower life cycle. And let's not even enter the discussion of how complicated it is to work with lithium. Any contact with oxygen, hugs and kisses to your right hand. What Samsung claims to have achieved is the end of all of that. Their recent article in Nature explains how they created a battery with 900 watt hour per liter and 1000 cycles. This represents a 50% improvement in terms of energy density, while more than 200% of battery life cycle. How they achieved this is fascinating. Samsung research was led by Young Gung Lee for an all-solid state battery. Their goal was to eliminate dendrites formation and increase coulombic efficiency. To do that, they sandwiched layers of lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide mixed with a sulfide solid electrolyte on top of a nanocomposite layer of silver carbon. All of this is located in between a foil of aluminum and stainless steel as the current collectors. The idea behind this was to remove lithium foil from the mix and have all lithium atoms part of the NMC or the SSE. This approach diminishes the cost of the overall battery manufacturing since handling lithium usually needs an oxygen-free environment due to its higher reactivity. This is important for a few reasons. In conventional lithium batteries, the anode comprised of lithium moves freely towards the positive electrode during discharge. Dendrites are formed during the charging process, when lithium moves back to its initial location thanks to the free movement enabled by liquid or gel electrolyte. This is the main limiting factor of how much energy can be stored in these batteries, since to control this, the amount of lithium available in the system has to be capped, limiting the energy density. The sulfide solid electrolyte approach guides lithium back and forth with a little help from silver, in a uniform manner allowing the atom to be deposited in flat layers with little to no chance of dendrites forming. Nice, right? But Samsung took this idea a step further. Most solid state battery technologies proposed to date have some sort of nanomatrix layer compound, like silica for instance, that is used to absorb lithium ions. By removing this layer and having only silver atoms playing the part of the matrix to guide the ions, you can effectively introduce more cathode into the mix, increasing the overall energy density of the battery, or 900 plus watt hours per liter. This approach also increases battery lifetime efficiency by 200%. In this scenario, all lithium in the system is allocated within the NMC molecules comprising the cathode of the system. Here, there is no anode and the stainless steel sheet works as the current collector to drive the reaction. So, the battery is initially in a discharged state. When the battery is being charged, lithium ions pass through the carbon layer attaching themselves to silver atoms. This in turn promotes a better connection of the lithium layer onto the stainless steel current collector. What you get in the end is a clean sheet of lithium silver free of dendrites. This cycle can be repeated more than a thousand times flawlessly. Samsung solved many problems here, but one of them stands out, and that is the construction of the battery. By having only the NMC cathode embedded into a solid electrolyte and separated by the nano layer of silver carbon, it eliminates the need for oxygen-free environment necessary for the construction of the battery, ultimately reducing cost. Although this is a huge gain, the impact on price for these new batteries is yet to be seen, but we know for sure that at least 35% of the final cost is due to manufacturing overhead, which includes energy costs, research and development, production, sales and so on. Then we have the remaining costs attributed to materials alone, comprising 60% of the final price. As I mentioned in an older video of mine, cobalt and nickel are to blame, since prices are increasing due to the high demand for these elements. That's why most companies are trying to move away from these elements. But it's safe to assume that Samsung may have used NMC here just to test the concept and acquire real-world numbers from this first prototype. At this point, it's still unclear where Samsung intends to use these batteries, but one thing is for sure, they still need more research and development so they can get rid of the nickel and cobalt. If they achieve this, then they will have the triple crown breakthrough. Cheap elements, high energy density, and a long lifetime cycle. And that is when we will finally have a dramatic drop in battery prices. Overall, this is a huge step forward for a solid state batteries, and we can safely say that we are closer and closer to an electric future. Alright folks, that's it, we're done here. Before ending, I would like to glance upon one more field of interest, and that is supercapacitors or ultra capacitors. These are basically capacitors with very high energy density. 
and thus act as a link between capacitors and battery. Unlike a battery, these supercapacitors store energy in the form of electric grid rather than a chemical storage. Thus, it has a high power density, meaning it can give a large amount of charge in a shorter period of time. This charge in supercapacitors is present on its surface between the electrode and the dielectric. Current, supercapacitor, current supercapacitors have very low energy density of about 10 watt hour per kg, which is about 5% the energy density of a lithium ion battery. Development, developments in this industry might change the way we look at the battery industry. And I'd like to top it off with a video explaining this and the battery industry a little more deeper. Today I'd like to start things off with a little game. So take a second and look around you and count all the things, all the devices around you that have batteries in it. Here, I'll do it with you. Uh, the computer that I'm recording this on has a battery on it. Camera has a battery on it. Mouse has batteries that are uncovered for some reason. Phone. I got a sound recorder over here. I got my GoPro. GoPro has a battery on it. Uh, oh, microphone pack. The point is our lives revolve around portable power. Batteries literally make our lives possible. And that trend is only accelerating, especially with the growing pace of electric cars. So the race is on to develop newer, better energy storage solutions. Our old friend, the AA battery, the nickel cadmium battery, it's done a good job, but it, it's not rechargeable. You can only use it once. It's very wasteful. You throw it away. Lithium ion batteries are rechargeable, but they take a really long time to charge and they eventually lose effectiveness. But there is a third option on the way. It's called supercapacitors. They charge immediately, they run forever, and they never wear down. There's just one thing we still have to figure out. Super answer file Matt Herring asks, can you do the video on supercapacitors? Matt asked this question as a premier supporter on Patreon. If you want to know how to do the same, of course, as always, go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. So how many times have you been texting somebody, um, doing general phone things, and then all of a sudden, oh man, your plans have suddenly changed. You've got to go find a cord and plug in. you got to sit next to the electric thing if you want to keep doing your phone stuff. I mean, the hell, man. Are we living in 2017 or aren't we? So before I can explain how supercapacitors will fix this, I need to back up and show you how batteries work in the first place. The simplest explanation is batteries transfer electrons from a negatively charged electrode called an anode to a positively charged electrode called a cathode, and the device that the battery is powering siphons electrons off to power that device. For example, nickel cadmium batteries use a nickel oxide cathode in a cadmium anode. That's the name. And it produces electrons through a chemical process called oxidation, which is used by an electrolyte layer sandwich between the two electrodes. In the case of nickel cadmium batteries, they use potassium hydroxide as the electrolyte. But this is a one-shot deal. It produces electrons, but there's no way to reintroduce electrons into the mix. So they're not rechargeable. And in a world that's increasingly reliant on portable devices, that's just not good enough. Enter lithium-ion batteries, which were developed back in the 1970s by a guy named John B. Goodenough. That's his real name. <laughs> yes, I'm, I know, thank you. I'm, I'm very proud to be the first person to ever tell that joke. It was, uh, it was, it was hard, but I pulled it off. Lithium-ion batteries, according to my analytics anyway, are responsible for powering the screens that about 75% of you are watching right now. Lithium-ion batteries have a cathode made of lithium, duh, and an anode made of carbon, again, with an electrolyte layer sandwiched in between. The difference is lithium can absorb more electrons, so it can be recharged, which is great, but it's still a chemical reaction, meaning it takes some time for that charge to take place. Supercapacitors work differently. Instead of using a chemical reaction to produce electrons, also known as an electrochemical process, they use static electricity, also known as an electrostatic process. Ever shock yourself on a doorknob after walking across carpet? That's basically how supercapacitors work. Now, capacitors have been in our computers for decades, and they basically work by holding opposing charges on two metal plates separated by a dielectric material. And much like that doorknob shock, the amount of electricity they carry is really tiny, but it transfers really quickly. Supercapacitors, as you may have already figured out, are larger versions of capacitors that actually double up those metallic plates so that they can hold more energy. In fact, they're often called double layer capacitors. And the cool thing is, since it's an electrostatic process instead of a chemical process, there's far less resistance to charge. In fact, it's almost instantaneous. The problem is, they don't hold that much energy. In fact, you would have to have a vast amount of surface area in order to be able to get anywhere near the kind of storage capacity that a lithium ion battery has. So lithium ions have a high energy density, meaning they hold a lot of electricity, whereas supercapacitors have a very high power density, meaning they can transfer that energy much faster. So if, theoretically, you could have supercapacitors with the same energy density as lithium ion batteries, you'd be able to charge your phone in seconds and be good for the rest of the day. And with wireless charging on the forefront, you might just be able to just set it down on a pad while you're eating breakfast and you're good to go. You could charge your laptop in the time it takes you to take a whiz. And dare we dream it, an EV that actually charges faster than it takes to pump gas. That is the dream. And there is one material that can make this dream a reality. It's called graphene. Graphene is basically a one layer thick lattice of carbon atoms, and it has some just insane properties. It's 200 times stronger than steel, but incredibly light. It's biodegradable, it's biocompatible, meaning you can use it inside the human body. They say it can be used to desalinate seawater, it can build space elevators, it can be the basis of supercomputers, but for our purposes, it also happens to be one of the most electrically capacitive substances known to man. It has the same energy density as lithium ion batteries, but with the power density of supercapacitors. And since it's only one atom thick, you can cram a lot of surface area in a tiny space. But much like the highly lauded carbon nanotubes, which are basically just tubes made out of graphene, these are very, very hard to make. In fact, nothing I'm saying here is really all that new. We've been hearing about supercapacitors made out of graphene since about 2013. One of our very most frustrating technology holdups we have today, actually. But it's not for lack of trying. In fact, some of the smartest people alive today are working feverishly to find a solution to this, and in the last couple of years, there's been some interesting developments. One group found that heating soybean oil to 800 degrees Celsius on a nickel foil caused the carbon atoms to arrange themselves in a one-layer lattice, basically graphene. So far, they've only created a small credit card size sample, but it's still a proof of concept. Another idea that could prove to be scalable is igniting acetylene and oxygen, which causes the atoms to arrange themselves in that lattice over a large 
surface area. The problem is it doesn't really arrange it in that one atom thick layer that we need. It's a lot more chunky. But it is a method that could be tweaked to get the result that they want. Bottom line is the person or group that finds the solution to this problem is going to be seriously, seriously rich. So because of that, there's a lot of people who are incentivized to work on it. That's a good thing. With any luck, in 10 or 15 years, we'll have supercapacitor batteries that can handle energy densities at industrial scales, giving us fast, easy electricity whenever we need it. In the meantime, our old friend John B. Goodenough and his colleague Helena Braga have worked on a new battery that uses a solid electrolyte that many are calling the impossible battery. It stores three times as much energy as a lithium ion and uses a sodium anode, so it's biodegradable and all the materials are cheap and easy to come by. 94 years old and still innovating. Good show, old chap. There's also the idea of hybrid batteries that contain both a lithium ion and supercapacitors, so you get the best of both worlds. Now, this, of course, was a very high level view. There's a lot of pros and cons of supercapacitors, and you can learn more about it in the links I've put down in the description. But let's talk about it in the comments. What do you think? Do you think that the promise of supercapacitors is overhyped? Why or why not? I, for one, think that this is a nut that we're gonna crack. I mean, there's just such an incentive for a person or a company to figure this out that somebody's gonna do it eventually. And it will probably be insanely expensive for a while. All new technologies are. But I mean, just look at cell phones and the way once it becomes, you know, normal and adopted, it takes off. Uh, you know, but I really think that once this gets figured out, it could be a real fundamental shift in the way we live our lives, especially when it comes to things like electric cars. So thanks to Matt for this question. I thought it was a very relevant question, and uh, I'm actually really glad I did this research because, like I said, I've been hearing about this for a long time, kind of fell off the radar, but it, it turns out there's actually some cool developments on the way. It gives me some hope that this is gonna uh, change things pretty soon. And I'm telling you, like, if you're looking for a field to get into, material science is the way to go. That's, that's where all the major innovations that are gonna just change the world are coming from. So that's my suggestion. Look into material science. I also want to thank all my other supporters on Patreon. We're at over 120 now, which is crazy pants, but uh, I wanted to give a shout out to the people who have joined since the last video. We got Michael Lewis, John claude Lemen, uh, Margaret Cooley, Greg Forsyth, Stephen Hughes, Pete Finnegan, Michael Lungberg, Mason Petrosky, Ajit, and Chris from Legion of Weirdos, who I got to hang out with at uh, VidCon. He's actually got a great channel himself. Go check that out if you like my kind of stuff. And as always, the sponsor for this video is Kankerboy.com. If you get canker sores and mouth ulcers on a regular basis, like I do, bane of my existence, I've had it my whole life. This is a supplement that actually prevents you from getting them. It works. You can give it a try. Just go to Kankerboy.com. Like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I encourage you to go check out some of my other videos because I talk about similar topics like this every Monday. And if you like that, maybe subscribe because I'm going to keep doing them. All right. Thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out and have an opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care. With this, we conclude our today's module on battery industry. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll meet tomorrow.